media and liberation. Interesting topic, um, <laughs> without a doubt. Um, so we'll just kind of talk. If you have anything to say, just shout it out. We're all uh, here in the same room. Um, so uh, I guess we'll just do introductions. I'm David uh, Day. Uh, my Twitter account is D-A-V-I-D-A-Y. Um, I tweet a lot about climate change. I'm very, very concerned about climate change. But I started uh, Together Boston, which is a music festival that starts in May, uh, May 14th. Um, we specialize in forward-thinking music, and I'll talk about some of the complications that come with promoting something like techno to the wider uh, community, and I think that's where we're going with the media and the liberation. Um, but Tom, uh, go, wh who are you? Yeah, hey, I'm Tom Dunn. Uh, I'm a writer. I've been writing for, uh, I write both fiction stuff and plays here, uh, playwright in residence at the Huntington right now, and I also uh, have been a writer for uh, Upworthy, which some of you have heard of, which uh, I can d dish on in some interesting ways, but uh, I'm kind of very interested in the idea of how stories in both a fiction and a nonfiction sense uh, can help kind of help inform people about the kind of topics and issues that the Pirate Party and stuff cares about and how to translate that to a larger audience through stories. What is the uh, a pirate is free password, Steve? Oh, that's actually not his. Oh, oh. is that you? <laughs> okay, who's got this? I need, I need a network. Can I use your pirate? Uh, so, oh. Uh, so there's one called CCB. Okay. And the password is community church. CCB community church. All right. Cool. So my name's Savon Chorleon. I lived in Boston from 2007 to around 2014. During that time, I was pretty active in the Pirate Party. Now I'd say I'm a little bit more post-political. I'm not too into politics, but I do appreciate all that the Pirate Party is trying to accomplish, so I'm happy to be here speaking today. I'm running a website called Bad Mirror TV. It's a personalized video broadcasting system that connects you with your local and global communities. So it actually speaks to a lot of the issues and concerns that have been brought up today. And I'm excited to tell you guys more about it and we'll show you a video at some point, um, a little kind of teaser about what, what it is. What's the website? Badmirror.tv. Yep. Yes, and we have uh, some free swag up at the front. You can get some lighters and uh, stickers and stuff like that. Uh, cool. So, um, yeah. Thanks for coming, guys. Thanks for having us, Pirates. Uh, pirates have been uh, coming and participating in our festival for ever since we started eight years ago. And, um, yeah, I, I, I think we live in a very interesting time. <laughs> I think it's just over, overstating it. Um, in the sense that media is completely uh, dissolved and ravished. I mean, I, 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 there's no... You know, the, the I suppose it's a fair assessment. You know, the, <laughs> I mean, I don't know who in here was the last who when was the last time you watched CNN? I don't know, I don't really <laughs> care to uh to watch it. Um, but the rise in YouTube independent journalism, I think, is shattering the narrative with people like Secular Talk, with the Young Turks, with um. The Humanist Report now. Um, I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about, but there's this incredible. A movement on YouTube for this independent investigative journalism that uh, is fascinating to me. I'm fascinated by it. The Corbett Report I just found out about. Uh, the Corbett Report is insane. He has like 400 podcasts now, 500 podcasts out of Japan. Um, and like so informative. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but when I start watching this stuff, um, things like, you know, uh, Secular Talk or, or whatever, um, I just can't get enough of it. Like, There's a lot of information out there, and I think a hard part is, it's one of the coolest and scariest parts I think of right now is that there are so many options, especially with more independent stuff, and it's and the curation aspect is almost is right. a crazy part of that of finding out where to go, what's reliable, who to listen to, and how to kind of digest all that. I think that is a big question. Well, I think that's the fun part, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it also takes a certain type of person to go out and, and search that. So I, I would challenge a little bit of what you had to say earlier about how, you know, the, maybe the mainstream media has been shattered, because I would say that they still, for the most part, define the narrative that we that, oh, that gets I discussed. I totally agree with that. Yeah. And, you know, even though we do have a lot of great tools like Twitter and Facebook to kind of throw out your messaging into the world, more often than not, 
even from you know what, I, what we call alt media services, they often are discussing what that narrative is. So even though maybe you disagree with the topic or, or the, the, the premise, you're still kind of playing in the sandbox that's been laid out for you by the few leading media controlling companies. So it's, that's something that concerns me a lot. And to your point around kind of the curation being an issue, that was a, lot, a big point of why we created Bad Mirror TV, because it's, it's a user-generated generated curation system, and it takes preferences based on where the people are. So the people who live nearest to you are going to have the biggest impact on the videos you end up seeing. It's geolocated. Yeah. That's cool. That's really interesting. That, yeah. kind of, that, that helps, kind of helps build more of a physical community oh, absolutely. as the internet kind of splinters things. Yeah, I certainly hope so. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more that the mainstream media is a pile of, uh, is a dumpster fire, um, but, and controls narrative. I just got done with doing social media for the NECAN network, so the cannabis convention was last weekend. Um, and one of the things that I thought was really interesting, and again, goes to my promotion of tech, techno music, is um, we didn't want the mainstream media to show up. There was like this nervousness when Fox came, or oh, yeah, when sure. CBS came, or when ABC came. What are they gonna say about it? What are they, you know, they control the narrative, so, we didn't want them there, which I think is interesting, um, in the sense that all they're going to do is show a pot leaf and a bunch of people smoking weed or whatever, you know, like a vapors or somebody, instead of focusing on medicine and epileptic children and healing veterans and this sort of narrative. So we sort of grabbed the mic and did a lot of Facebook Live and a lot of this kind of self-promotion uh, and controlled it ourselves. So I think when it comes to media and what is the topic? Liberation. I think the liberation comes <laughs> We came well prepared, people. <laughs> I think the liberation comes from controlling it yourself. And same thing with uh, promoting, promoting techno music and dance music, uh, yeah. electronic music, whatever the fuck that means. Um, that doesn't mean anything anymore. Um, we pushed, so I just want to real quickly tell this story. So we pushed uh, early on to promote our community efforts and our creation, creative economy and promoting artists and promoting local technologies and promoting all this stuff and, and how we contributed to the creative economy. And we tried to get it in the mainstream media. We were, we were trying to get it told of how we are a good thing. You know, we're not a bunch of people doing molecule or molly or whatever. So we got it. We got it in the paper. We got it uh, in a writer who shall remain nameless. And it was in the Metro. So that day we ran to the Metro uh, you know, and picked up the paper and turned to page five. And the headline said, um, Boston, uh, Together Boston brings EMD Festival <laughs> to Boston, to Cambridge. <laughs> EMD Festival. So all of a sudden we were an emergency medical devices festival <laughs> with like D, you know, DJ dialysis or something. Um, uh, but, and, and, and we eventually learned that we had to tell the story ourselves because people are going to approach things like the Pirate Party and think we're a bunch of radical nut jobs, which maybe we are, but uh, they're going to tell the story. And at the end of the day, we don't want them here. You know, I don't want the globe covering together because they're just going to say, oh, it's, a, you know, it's about, you know, repetitive beats or something, or, or, like music isn't repetitive. But you know, like, it, it, they're gonna, they're gonna dis, what, I don't know, disparage us. Sure. So, uh, you know, it, it, we have to kind of liberate ourselves from that. And I don't know, what, what's the best way to do that, Tom? Well, I mean, I think that's, like, that's, that's the trick. Uh, I, when I, before I, I had joined up where the, uh, I kind of, like, they are definitely, uh, I would say pretty much responsible for uh, opening up the Pandora's box of clickbait in the universe. And I Definitely. got annoyed because, uh, bef because they were doing it for good issues, but I kept clicking on it and I was like, God damn, I'm falling for the same trick on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and I started, and I started like a parody website making fun of them. It was just like Star Wars memes with Wait, what's it called? Clickbait. What's that called? It was called a SFF worthy. SFF it SF worthy. You know, it's a, there's a Tumblr. And it was just like oh. me making a corny like Star Wars and Batman jokes. With, and they thought it was funny, and I found it. And I was like, I do. I like the idea of like react of like finding ways that people are going to respond to. Okay. And uh, as I kind of joined the company, what 
we, we relied on a lot, I'm there, on, I'm there on a freelance basis now, but we did a lot of, uh, we, we, we used a lot of data information uh, on several levels, and we see what people are actually responding to, <laughs> and uh, stuff like that. But, so that started as a joke, but what was interesting about this is seeing, uh, through the data, that, the data we collect on things, is also seeing what people click on. There's sometimes frustrating ways where we took it amongst ourselves, and we're like, how are we gonna, how are we gonna show that like, this, this kind of, this, com this computer music company is doing good community work. Mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we translate that in a way that people are gonna respond to? And we use a lot of data, like lots of A-B testing and saw like, what are people clicking on? Mm -hmm. Are they scrolling through and actually reading? Are they sharing? And we try to check out all these metrics and see like, what are they actually responding to? And sometimes it's tough. Sometimes you're like, oh, you, you, like, you find some headline that is, some of, them are, some of them are too good and you realize people are just clicking on it because they're clicking on it because it seems clickable. And you don't want to be misleading. So there's like a, a, a tough line of honesty there, but you want to find a way to tell a story that they can relate to on a human to human emotional level generally and show them that, but in a way that is still intriguing. And that's right, right. There's no singular answer for it, but it's, I think, a really interesting challenge in this time. In, as you're saying, like, as you're saying, like, the, like CNN is like still controlling our narrative. Well, how do, we, how do we find a way that then we can use that narrative, capitalize on it? Because people are going to click on certain things, you know. There's whatever, whatever is the controversial topic of the day that's trending on Twitter. It's you know, fire festival or whatever right now. And like, <laughs> how do you use that to talk fire about festival. to talk about so other issues? And how do you kind of like capitalize that and reclaim the narrative in the way that people are already that are already talking about that same narrative? Steve, do we have sound? Do you have a sound guy? Uh, do you, know? you have to put your mic up against the computer. Okay. Right I think you got to the core of the issue really about what we mean by liberation because you know we don't live in a country where we're, for the most part we're silenced you can say whatever you want and kind of throw it out into the the void it's whether or not it picks up any traction and there's a couple yeah. of things <laughs> that we can say pretty definitively are going to be a like a good indicator of where there will be traction and one thing is does it fit the narrative so are people already talking about it and regardless if that's something they should be talking about mm -hmm. so that's one of the reasons you see all the people kind of fall in step with the narrative. And then the second thing is, well, is it entertaining? It, because, you know, we, we're kind of in a brave new world. You know, they had like the Soma, like entertain people to death type thing. So we can educate ourselves. Like you were saying, there's so much good stuff out there, but not everyone's looking for it because at the end of the day, it's not entertaining. And that was sure. a big part of what went into the Bad Mirror TV because it came from a point of like, philosophical, political ideas, but it's not packaged that way. When you go to the website, you don't know that. It's, it's totally not obvious. What I'm doing is entertaining you, and you're going to sit there, and by virtue of you being entertained, you're now gonna be a better informed citizen. You're gonna know what's going on around you. You're gonna know who the local celebrities are, who the local politicians are, because if you wanted to, you could find that out, right? Anyone can go into Google, spend a few hours, find that out, but no one does it because it's not fun. <laughs> right? uh, and, well, I don't know. I don't know. And when I, I say no one, I'm not literally no one, but like people yeah. for the most part are fairly ignorant about local issues and not well, because it's not available to them, but because they're not seeking it out. Right. I do think that's changing, though. I really do. I mean, um, recently, David Packman, uh, Benjamin Dixon, both of whom are based in Boston, um, you know, secular talk. Uh, and the Young Turks and all these independent journalists got demonetized by YouTube. It was a big scandal. It was a big, big problem for them. So guys like David Pakman said, well, I'm going to start a Patreon. And like they had six Patreon, uh, you know, members giving them money. The next day he had 600 and something Patreon people giving him money. And I think the fun of it, as to your point, is they're telling the truth. And the truth is fun. You know, like it's really fun <laughs> to actually hear somebody talking about the truth. Yeah, I mean, that's when you hit that uh, and, fun and, spot. The sweet spot is when it's truthful and fun. Totally. Yeah, and Secular Talk's a great example of that. I mean, uh, Kyle is uh, irreverent and, you know, drops F-bombs when appropriate, and, and I, it's so fun to watch him excoriate. Or Jimmy Dore, the Jimmy Dore show, you know, is a TYT uh, satellite, and he's a comedian. And usually I don't find comedians funny, but the way he escort just r just rips the DNC, you know, just routinely is just hilarious and fun. But um, so let's learn about Bad Mirror. Here we've got it up here. Um, All right, excellent. It's, oh wait, okay. Nothing happened on YouTube. Here we go. Oh, is it coming out there? It's coming out from somewhere. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, we can do some pause. Um, but, you know, and uh, the Corbett report, you know, like I just constantly, I can't stop watching the Corbett report, not because he's funny or because it's fun, but because it's so informative, you know? <laughs> it's like addictive. Well, that's also probably why, how, like, things like Colbert Report and Daily Show picked up in the first place is because they turned politics into a funny thing. And there are ways well, to do that in a way that's not, that's Cor not that doesn't talk I'm not talking about Colbert Report. No, but that's what I'm saying. Like, it's, I think that, that's why that started off as a trend. Originally. Oh, I think, yeah, I think that trend was trash. Like, we can't, <laughs> we're, we're, we're talking about politics like it's a, a comedy show. Right. You know, it was really bad. Well, and then, and then CNN, and, and now they're mirroring the, the sports networks. Uh, what's his name at CNN is just... It's they're treating politics as sport, which is even more reprehensible than co co treating it as comedy. Um, all right, we we're good or no? We're not good. I mean, you can just play and and just. Well, actually, it looks like the volume's not even all turned all the way up on the thing. Maybe, we, yeah, you do that and then we'll okay. see if the mic can pick some of it up. We'll talk about it. Television. Today, yeah, maybe I'll do that. You want to mute it? And I'll, talk, I'll talk about it. It's being realized by content producers and subscribers. Yep. So, so basically, the idea is that. Um, something like Reddit already exists, where users can share videos and other users vote them up because they think they're valuable. And for the most part, those are usually. It's like a social news website. And going back to the point of entertainment is kind of the currency that you need to use to maybe activate people and create change, I, th I saw that as a, a bad mirror as a kind of one step forward where uh, we kind of ditched the, the news element and we go just straight for video. And so the idea is that anyone can share a video, but instead of sharing it with their friends and family like on a normal social media website, you know, your existing social network, you're actually sharing it with a location. So you can share a video with your town and you're guaranteed presuming that people from your town are watching, that they're going to see the video. So no matter how bad the video is, you are going to have a local audience. And that's really valuable because it's going to create an environment where you know what's going on around you. And so presuming that the video that you shared is actually of high quality, people can vote it up. And then the reach of the video will increase. So it'll be seen not only in your, in your town, but in your county, in your state, in your region of the world, and uh, so on and so forth. And you know, there, there's so many things that I think this can have an impact on. And, and one story that I like to use to kind of demonstrate the, the impact that I would like to see it is ha uh, happen with this website is like, we hear a lot about Iran, right? And like, usually it's in a propaganda form. What would it be like if you can type in Iran, Tehran, Iran, and see what the people there are sharing? What is their culture? What, are, what do they find valuable? And you can sit there and maybe you spend half an hour, 45 minutes watching what's going on in, in Tehran, and you're going to come away with a totally different perspective than what's been presented to you through the news. And, and so I, I see it just building lots of bridges, not just within your community, but across cultures. And, um, and that'd be great. Yeah, and that's, and that's really what I'm hoping for. So uh, we, just I guess some background about the website, we, we had a beta up for the past year, which validated that it was worth watching. People were watching it for 30, 45 minutes at a time, and now, uh, we're, we're doing a redesign of the website and launching it within the next month. So hopefully you guys can enjoy the, the TV viewing experience that is Bad Mirror TV soon on a TV near you. I think what you're trying to accomplish there with that, like, with that, even with that Tehran example, is a, really, is a good, really good example of the power of stories that like, I think like hu humans, like I've always thought like the big thing that sets humans off from like animals is that we tell stories and that's how people connect to people. And a lot of people have a lot of similar desires, no matter what, even like across different politics. Yeah. People want similar things, and people get people. And by showing them, like, here's what normal people, being people, care about in a place like Tehran, yeah. you are changing the narrative. And because it's just a human to human story, it's the way that people say that, like, the way like marriage equality became more normalized, just like more people met queer people. Right. And as you were like, oh, my neighbors fall under the LGBTQ spectrum, and like, cool. I get them as a human, and that's like a good way to. Yeah, they, they leave from caricature to being a human. Right, and I've, and that's that's actually an incredible way to use us to to, to control to, yeah, to take control of that narrative and use a story about like here's someone here's a person caring about a thing enough to make a video about it, and that spreads, and then you have that character as a person. You're like, oh, I get that as a human. 
yeah. as a human being, yeah. and I followed that as a story. And another example right here is just like Steve's filming this, right? I've gone to so many meetups over the years where they're filming it, and then you go and see the YouTube page, and there's like 10 views, you know? And it's something that's relevant that I, I actually left my house to go watch. So I, I, you know, I enjoyed it, but the person's not going to spend the time pimping it, paying ads for it, putting it on Facebook every week. So they put it on Facebook once, it gets 10 views, and then never gets seen again. And all that social capital is just gone, you know? Well, I think um, when, I mean, when it comes to liberation, I mean, personally, when I moved, I just, you know, I moved in October and I stopped Do we still need for, this? Are we going to watch stuff? Uh, well, we can just, if we bring something else okay, up, cool, I guess. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I stopped uh, paying for cable and I just went to full internet. Cord now I, all I do is watch YouTube and th these are the people, I, you know, this is my YouTube subscriptions, you know, the real news, the Young Turks, Al Jazeera English. Uh, you know, George Webb. I don't know if you know George Webb, but crazy uh, what that guy's doing on the internet. Um, you know, uh, RT, you know, Russia Today got, was, you know, was reported uh, by the CIA for disrupting our, our, uh, our election when all they did was report on the Clinton Foundation. <laughs> like, they, they, that's all they did. And now all of a sudden they're uh, informed by the Kremlin or something. Um, H. A. Goodwin's pretty good, and you know they're not. They're all pretty. Uh, Tim Black TV is amazing. He's been really good lately. Um, but I guess uh, the mainstream media is so ir becoming more irrelevant, like by the minute, like by the by the hour. You know, like they cover the the science march and never mention climate change. I guarantee you, I, I would be shocked if any of the climate march that's going on today was on mainstream media at all because they, they're not allowed to say climate change. You know, they're not allowed to, uh, you know, uh, say certain things. So they're just becoming more and more irrelevant. You turn it on and all they do is talk about Russia. It's like, what is this? Like, where, where, where are we? Like, is anyone gonna talk about CO2 levels that are spiking? Like, is anyone gonna talk about? And where you have to go to satisfy your need is, is you know, independent media, yeah. independent YouTube, uh, self-broadcasting folks, yeah. you know? It's certainly an exciting trend. And I, I guess one thing to where we're not there yet is that a lot of the alt media that is getting produced is very referential to the mainstream media. So it'll be like, why isn't this being reported on CNN? Or like, what, you know, or they'll like show right, an right. anchor on CNN and what they are talking about versus what they should be talking. And it's still giving them power. You know, it's still. Uh, we have to get away from that, yeah. Why not? But then TYT politics. Well, you that's know. an interesting question. Why not? So we'll change how people think using our own tools, right? Yeah, we'll crack that by sharing video, independent, you know, journalist videos. And I mean, I was talking to my mom. I'm from Kansas. I'm from like the reddest part of the world. And uh, I was talking to my mom about cannabis. And uh, by the end of it, she was sharing my video, uh, my Facebook video with the veterans, you know, New England Veterans Alliance, where they talk about, you know, how cannabis saved their lives. And, you know, if my mom can be convinced that cannabis is a medicine within about 30 minutes, I think uh, I can tell you right now, you can convince an elephant, you know, that a mouse is going to kill it. I mean, I, I mean, I couldn't believe that she listened to me, but I was just informed and I had the right things to say. And because of that, um, I changed my mom's mind. And to, to, to one more illustration of how mainstream media is totally irrelevant. Um, with regard to electronic music or dance music or disco or whatever music. Um, a couple of years ago, we had a, at Together Boston, we had a panel with a bunch of local music journalists, uh, a couple of very high powered music journalists. And one, one question was put to her, or sorry, this person, which was, um, why don't you cover what we do? You know, we've had a party, we've done a, a, a dance party for 15 years. You know, we're all about uh, people and community. How come you never write about us? And the Boston Globe, sorry, <laughs> the journalist <laughs> said, uh, she literally said this, sorry. Um, I can't, she said, I can't write about what I don't know about. Oh, geez. And I wanted to say, that's, you just described what journalism is. You know, like, <laughs> you, you write about things you don't know about. Like, that's the point, you know? You don't write about a murder because you don't know the family who got murdered, right? You go, who, who got murdered? Why they, you know, whatever. So like, uh, journalism is in this bubble and silo and, and, and just strengthens the silo every given day. 
Like they're so tied to their whatever it, it, traditional ways that they just Operation break Mockingbird out of it. is a real thing, right? Do you guys know what the CIA Operation Mockingbird? No. So it's I think started in the seventies. Uh, sure. I mean, that's on you to do that. So uh, I, I, I might misspeak on some of the details, but essentially it was oh, a, wow. <laughs> a plan to put CIA operatives into news organizations to craft narratives and to sway po public opinion. Um, so there aren't really great documented cases of specific people being an Operation Mockingbird sure. operative, but there, there's a lot of information about it being in existence, and um, it, it, I find it very creepy, honestly. And and then oh, yeah. there's people even like um, Anderson Cooper, who potentially can be he one. Because he yeah. exactly he used yeah. to be for, work for the CIA or intern for the CIA, and then you know he quit, supposedly, maybe, maybe not. No, you never quit the CIA. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. I don't know enough about well, it. Well, I think I think those organizations like the CIA and those kind of deep state uh, actors are losing control of the narrative. I really do believe that. I think we're in a time of, of, of information liberation that is revolutionary. And, um, you know, that's... I certainly hope so. I, I think Black Mirror or Bad Mirror is a part of that. You know, I think uh, Netflix or Hulu or these kind of, you know, consumption alternatives are a part of that. I mean, I can't even watch TV. I mean, I see a TV and it just bugs the crap out of me because I see commercials. Like, I haven't seen commercials too, yeah, in yeah. like a few years at this point. It's like, ah, commercial. Wow. Yeah. You know, so like... And the trends are going that way. More people are cord cutting, like 100%. not paying for cable and, and they're looking for alternatives. So it, the, the trends are, are great in terms of people becoming more educated. I, I mean, I think I don't even see it as a trend. I see it as, a, as an inevitable conclusion. Yeah. That... that I mean, I watch some of these independent journalists on YouTube, and I really feel like I'm living in kind of this Orwellian world now where the one place you I are. can find true actual information is these little tiny bits on the Internet, you know. And then I see them, and it's just like it's, it, it consumes you. You're like, oh, my God, that was truth. I want more truth, you know. And so, so news, my, the first lesson I learned in journalism school, literally the first thing my journalism professor said to me was, they call it news because it's new and I'll never forget that because I never really underst I never understood why they call it news. And so I think when you talk about traditional siloed, institutionalized journalists, they've completely lost that. Like they don't even you know, like the, the, going back to the electronic music convention. Um, you know, uh, she said the, the woman, the person that said, "I uh, don't, I can't cover what I don't know about." She, um, they said, well, and also my editor is older and whiter than I am and more male than I am. So if he wants me to cover Billy Joel at Fenway Park or cover Avicii at, at the TD Garden, he's going to want me to go cover Billy Joel. Like, we haven't said endless amounts of <laughs> reviews of Billy Joel shows. But um, at the end, you know, and I just imagine this, this structure of the, the new print, the press pressing plant, and a wrecking ball just going yeah. through it, and the editor is sitting there on his typewriter, you know, like assigning Billy Joel stories. It's like, you know, there, there, there's, it, it, it's, it's dead. Would it's you say over. that he's like he's like Billy Joel playing piano man, like at last call to bar yeah. by himself? Yeah. Yes, right. drunk, not remembering the lyrics. <laughs> yeah, uh, abusive to his wife. But um, when it comes to like that cord cutting, they're like, you know, I think that there, it is interesting about like generation changes and geographic changes and that stuff, because like. I have like a ten dollars satellite, like HD satellite in my house for like one of the few times I want to put on something that's on like sure. ABC broadcast or whatever. Yeah. Um, and it's amazing, like the, the commercials I see on that versus the commercials I see on YouTube or Hulu that are like catered to me versus the broad ones. Right. And I think that's probably uh, to the point of like why so much of these like of these things are responding to things like CNN because there are still large swaths of the country that like like Kansas and, and stuff that like that's what people are still and it's always getting. cars it's always ad for cars like constant Toyota ads it's like I don't want a new car <laughs> I just you know I have a car it takes me to a place it's a cheap car whatever I don't want a new car you know and and you know the, the Car salesmen are really hurting because of that, man. <laughs> oh, I know. I trust me. Every every single industry is going through revolutionary radical change. I, I'm thoroughly convinced of that, and, and the media is a part of that. And what you're saying about having ads catered to me. So secular talk was was demonetized by YouTube, and then they had they instead of the word Syria in their 
in their title for the YouTube, they would put the I with like an, an, a, a, uh, a accent on it or something. That's how they got around being demonetized. Like YouTube was demonetizing things that talked about Syria. And uh, so instead of saying Syria, they said Syria, you know, with like an a, I with an accent. And then they remonetized them. And this ad for some goofy yogurt came on. I forget, Yusa or yogurt or Yusa yogurt or something. And I literally was at Stop and Shop the next day and I bought that yogurt because they had advertised to me via my favorite, you know, alternative news channel. So, you know, I guess in the ad circular, you know, process there, that worked. Like, I just bought it. Some yogurt I didn't give a shit about. Uh, as opposed to, yeah, the, the, so I guess there is a benefit to kind of this hyper catered advertising. Your phone is listening to you. Well, <laughs> well uh, since we're talking I, about it, I really do like that yogurt. I forget the name of it. Okay. You know, well, one of the exciting things that we're hoping to do with Bad Mirror is when, when it comes time to monetize and, and create a revenue stream is we want to create uh, serve local ads as well. And, oh, that'd be great. Yeah, and so it's kind of exciting to think about like what it would look like for your corner deli to run a five cent ad about their lunch special and then Subway to be like, you know, 10 minutes later to see a Subway ad. And all of a sudden they're competing over a sandwich ad space, you know, which is kind of inconceivable now. Or if you were to see that on the television. Advertising on, on, on Bad Mirror or yeah, local, you know, local, uh, you know. Yeah, and they, I mean, they can post there. videos on for free as well. Uh, if, and like a politics channel, but let's right. say they wanted to talk to people who are interested in skateboarding or whatever, then yeah, maybe they would do a paid ad. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we, we've kind of mentioned it in a very peripheral way, but I kind of want to call it out specifically while we're on the soapbox here is that like, we talked about crowdfunding. You mentioned um, Patreon. Patreon. I think crowdfunding is one of the most powerful political tools at our disposal. And it's not talked about enough explicitly, and, and so I really want to call it out, is like, there are going to be challenges to the things we care about. So in this instance, we're talking about free speech and being able to monetize speech and whatever, you know, whatever. Being able, not dissuading people from saying unpopular stuff through demonetization. And to them, the solution was crowdfunding. And I would really challenge us to look at crowdfunding in all phases of life and think about, well, how, what does that mean? Like, what problems can we solve with crowdfunding? And that's one of the things we're going to hopefully accomplish with Bad Mirrors. We're going to have built-in crowdfunding at a local level where someone can propose an issue. My town has potholes. And we can choose to run a candidate, and maybe 10 years later we'll get fixed. Or we can crowdfund it you know, within a week and pay Joe Schmo to go fill the, fill the pothole. Right, or you know? we could crowdfund to build a bike path or yeah, something like exactly. that. Exactly, right, yeah. Right, so right. community-driven projects that are community-funded. And well, I we think just had a presidential campaign that was crowdfunded. So, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know. Ta I mean, uh, taxes are the original crowdfunding, except there's yeah, no right, control right, over where, they, where they go now at this point. Right. Exactly right, yeah. Oh, I watched a great video on YouTube about anarchy the other day. Um, anarchy makes so much sense. Um, so anyway, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, how much time, Steve, do we have? Should we uh, ask people to talk about other stuff? You've got about 15 minutes left. So is anyone else, who in here has cut their cord, so to speak? I'm curious, like, do you have, is anyone in here still? Fantastic. Yeah. Never had a cord. Never, never had a cord, never. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're a lucky duck. That's a term man. for you. Um, yeah. What do you guys think about ESP? Uh, oh, it's it's in it's in it's in big bad trouble, man. It's in big bad trouble. The, 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 the entire sports industry, I think, is in terrible trouble. Like uh, they they have uh, a a bottoming out uh, uh, group of people that watch it. And I know that might sound crazy to you, but trust me. Uh, People are getting less and less int interested in sports. It's starting to be a, a big thing, I yeah. think. And I'd say I'm fairly ignorant on it, but I do know that the live programming is one of the more valuable ones for the legacy broadcasting systems and sports yes. being one of the bigger ones. So exactly. But it is still their cash cow. But ESPN specifically, I don't, I don't know much and about And I think ESPN. it's because people are smoking more and more weed or ingesting more and more <laughs> cannabis. I really think cannabis is, is a big uh, a, a silent actor in this information revolution that we're having. I mean... Well, here, I mean, here's something like I, like I heard about the C, like CNN's like or ESPN's like what 600 layoffs this week, um, and yeah, 
I, so I grew up in Connecticut, and it actually has been interesting seeing like how terrified my family is and stuff because of how much CNN or uh, ESPN is a central Bristol. part of the economy in the Bristol area, and that's six. That's like six hundred really well-paying jobs that are gone. That's why they need and to pass you know, legalize cannabis so they can open little shops uh, in Bristol and we can all... Uh, and then they can advertise on Bad Mirror. Yes. So great. they can build more nice local community, loop. hyper local community through the internet. Yep. Bingo. Utopia. All right, guys. <laughs> thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> Problem solved. I mean, uh, I, you know, I, I do say I, I, I really had a life-changing experience at the cannabis convention. I mean, I, I, I think there is something to that, you know, uh, billion, multi-billion dollar industry that's coming to Massachusetts. Um, and, uh, you know, at least the more I ingest cannabis, the more interested I get in things that aren't typically mainstream. So, yeah. I don't know. I, it I, does I, make you kind of challenge a lot of assumptions. And it, yeah. it, there's not a surprise that, or it's not a coincidence that our advertising is, is uh, lighters. Yes. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, you know, in Denver, there are more pot shops than there are Starbucks. I mean, it, that's a fact. That's crazy, right, to think about. And, and not only that, coffee consumption is going down, alcohol consumption is going down, and opioid use is almost disappearing. So, you know, if, how does that apply to media and liberation? Well, I do, I do think it applies, you know. I think it's about telling a story. And that's the unfortunate part is, like, when having a mainstream media that controls a narrative versus an alternative narrative. And I think you tell the story of like, hey, shit, cannabis is really good for people. Right. Uh, <laughs> and you need to show people in an actionable way and in a, a, like an emotional human level. Like, here's a veteran. Here's him. Here's gooder things happening. Right. And, and, and again, going back, I guess, to the, my, my, my point was when the mainstream media showed up, uh, we got really nervous. And in fact, we outlawed the globe from coming to NECAN. There, there, there was an, uh, between you and me, I guess this is on the internet, Sorry, Mark. But, um, you know, there was an in, 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 in debate in, inside the, the network was like, do we want them to come? Because, like, they're so anti us. Do we even want them to show up? And I think that applies to a lot of industries now, you know, whether that's uh, open book management at a restaurant. Like, do you want people to report about open book management, which is revolutionizing the restaurant business? Because they may see it as like you know an anarchist or a, you know a radical action when in fact it benefits everyone, um, or like look at socialism and and Bernie like do you, you know people were like oh we can't run Bernie because the media will criticize him as a socialist well it turns out socialism is actually really popular <laughs> you know <laughs> uh, you know to, to a lot of people at least to, being open to talk about it certainly is. Um, and like so, the narrative is breaking, and I think, and I think that's a good thing for when it comes to uh, the media. I really do think it's breaking. So share it, you know, share the things that you like, and uh, promote the things that you like with your people, and uh, contribute to the uh, breaking of the narrative. Yeah, and you know, there's only so many hours in the day, so you can really only focus on so many things. So, you know, the question was, you can't really stop. Walk, you know, you can't just totally ignore them. Well, to whatever extent you can, I think you're going to benefit from it. It's going to at least for me, it makes me less stressed out. I, I feel like my hours are being put to better use if I'm focusing on something that is interesting me versus something I'm supposed to be interested in, sure. whether or not I am. Well, and I don't think, I don't think, I definitely don't think we should ignore them, but more and more people are just ignoring them on their own. So, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, think about that. Anyway. I uh, guess a, a way of, of even like taking over that narrative and that when you're paying attention to things you care about and just focusing on your own stuff, like you would look at like the Bernie becoming to the forefront. You look at like Black Lives Matter coming to the forefront, Standing Rock stuff. And those ha have now become like central to a narrative. All and that was all because people kind of started paying attention to the things they cared about and it grew. Yeah, it grew right. organically and that kind of, like to planet, the point, like the point where Earth, it was impossible to ignore. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and, I, and, and just the fact that you know about Standing Rock, I mean, Standing Rock was never discussed in the mainstream media, ever. Like, maybe for, like, 30 seconds. I think point. it was discussed when, when, when the, uh, the veterans of Standing Rock showed up and won yeah. the thing for a day. Right, yeah. And then they were like, hey, it's over. Everyone go I home. love veterans. <laughs> I love veterans, let me tell you. Veterans should just run the country, I feel like. Okay, questions, anyone? Anyone have any questions? Yeah. Or so, comments. Yeah, okay, so you touched on this a bit, but I mean, it's it's great that old media is dying, but a lot of these new platforms are completely dependent on selling data, selling ads, and sort of tailoring algorithms to do both. 
Is there a way to get past that? I guess Bad Mirror probably does that. Well, from a user perspective, I take pretty large strides to prevent that. So I have ad blockers and tracking blockers and stuff like that. But that's not maybe for the average person. I would say that ads inherently are not bad. They're bad because they've been perverted to some extent, where they, they rely on fear and consumerism to sell you stuff you don't need and make you feel bad about yourself. But the idea that you can put out an ad and inform people about something that they, you find important, willing enough to spend money on it, that inherently is not bad, right? So we maybe we want to do an advertisement for this event because we want people to know about the pirate party or you, you're starting a new product and you want people to know about it and you want to know like, the details about it. If, if, so that's when we create our advertising model, it's going to incentivize people to create the shortest ad possible that's the most informative that people are going to want to upvote versus downvote uh, because we're going to, there's going to be a feedback mechanism in that. So I would say that at, if you're getting data sold, I don't personally like it, but at least be told that it's being done so you have a choice, whether or not it's even a real choice. But And then in terms of ads, um, you know, Less ads are always better, I guess. I don't like ads, but they, you got to make money somehow. Well, I think, uh, and, and uh, going back to the Patreon thing, I mean, if, if David Pakman or, or, or Titus Frost or, or whoever mm -hmm. started to get, have me pay them, right, a subscription model and have no ads, I would do that in a heartbeat. You know, going back to actually the old subscription, print subscription yeah. for your tabloid newspaper that you supported because they were inherently biased. I mean, remember when when papers and newspapers were inherently biased? Like, <laughs> what, what happened? Why, why, why did we get in this off? Yeah, the media's always been biased, man. Yeah, like, <laughs> communist today. Okay, that's the newspaper that I'm buying. Um, but yeah, I think paying, I would gladly pay these citizen journalists whatever they wanted. And that's becoming easier than ever. There's cryptocurrency that's making it easier than ever. Uh, earlier, I think Jamie had his laptop connected. He had Brave Browser on, and that has built in uh, financing for the web pages you like. I don't know. I don't know if it's up and running yet, but like that's the idea. So we're going to see that happen. Where y there's going to be some wallet that's attached to your browser that every time you visit a site, you're you're paying a micro payment. When that happens, well, I can't tell you, but, um, well, you get to decide. You will get to decide. But. <laughs> there is a, there is, I forget his name, there's a professor at MIT who's kind of, who's, who's has like a whole economic model that's actually based on monetizing our own personal data so that we could potentially like, you have your data and you could like You're buy a sandwich. It, right? It'd be like, I, in exchange for this data, because my data has value in this system, I will essentially give you, I will tell you, I will, I just I will turn you to sandwich. this, yeah, I will give you this data in exchange for a sandwich. Fascinating. And, it's still like in the works, but it's an interesting idea. Well, that's idea. interesting. We've got to figure out how to, how to do that it was. Yeah. So with the Wall Street Journal attacking major platforms like you do and things like that, how have you seen that impact affect your own models in that regard? Right. Uh, I think you're referring to like how... Um, Pulling out all their money from YouTube and stuff like that, yeah, right? Like, well, again, no, there's like a blacklist. He's referencing. There's like some uh, yeah, academic who created a blacklist of websites, and like half of them were not bad. Half of them were accurate, but just they unpopular. Well, for example, like going after PewDiePie and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Ron Paul Liberty. How did Report, that affect stuff like that? How did that affect you guys as a whole? Well, I mean, I went into a panic mode without a doubt that you know if if the if the state was coming down on my independent news channels um you know i i i gave them money i mean i was i was giving pacman uh, patreon money um i still do it's like a two a buck a month or something like i who knows you know i don't care um i guess it's not going towards my new toyota that i'm going to buy because i saw it on network television but um yeah, I don't know. How did it affect you guys? Did you uh, would, notice an effect there? Or? Um, well, well, let me re clarify the question. So, you guys have your own TV program through Bad, or Bad Mirror TV, correct? So, with the major target on corporate media against the YouTubes, against the alt medias, how has it affected bad, the Bad TV or Bad Mirror TV? Well, it hasn't because we're not on the radar yet. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we, we had this little beta out and, and hopefully it will be worthwhile for them to smash or try to smash. But mm -hmm. I would say that the really only existential threat to us is I'll if like a name. SOPA type bill passes, that would really screw us up. But I mean, yeah, uh, the, uh, what the Wall Street Journal says, like, it, it, you know, trying to badmouth 
uh, other journalists or other outlets, I think in, I think more than anything, it's probably gonna backfire, you know, because it's like it it seems so um, desperate, you know, because like you have to look at us, look at, don't look at these other people. Their uh, latest FCC news is tr troubling, for, you know, without a doubt. I mean, um, you know, yeah. closing down the internet is gonna be a real problem. Uh, but Steve, did you have a question? Yeah, I did. I mean, my background in media, um, if you want to call it a background, is I worked uh, in public radio for about 10 years. And public radio is, this is getting back to ads. So with public radio, you don't have advertising. You might have some underwriting, but it's, you know, that's a very gentle kind of ad. But a lot of the, the way most public radio stations get, at least in Boston, get their money, is by going, um, going on the air, two, three, four times a year, and just asking for it. Um, and, I, so, and I've always thought that, you know, it's actually um, a, a fair model, because, I mean, if you're providing, you the be, as a media producer, providing something of value, um, you know, there's nothing wrong in asking people to support what you're doing. Um, and I have, so far, I've only, I haven't seen, I haven't seen much of the larger media outlets Maybe ESPN to will. Maybe. <laughs> Can you imagine a damn fun drive? But I mean, for, for, my, for myself, I would rather, um, rather than fight with, uh, you know, intrusive advertising, I'd rather just pay a couple bucks. Yeah, it's a yep. good one. I mean, Wikipedia, right? Yeah. That's, yeah. It works for them. Right. Uh, one thing about, like, those ma like, places like Wall Street Journal ch tr trying to poke at other places, I think, we're, I think people overlook the power of... Uh, of Facebook uh, instant articles and Google AMP because the way that they, like the, the visual interface changes so that like someone who has a random ass WordPress website and they just write whatever propaganda they want that's without any basis in fact, they can sign up for Facebook instant articles, get advertising revenue from that and you click on it and it loads faster through Facebook where people get their information from now and it looks the same, it looks similar enough because it's in their like platform base. Yeah. So, whether you're on Wall Street Journal or whether you're on I'm a doofus .wordpress.com, it could look the same I through look Facebook. That up. I'm a doofus. <laughs> I own the domain name if anyone wants to buy it. But uh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so that stuff is, the, and I think that's also make, kind of helping. It, the good side is it helps democratize that stuff, but the bad side is to control the bad information. That I also think there. the media is in a, the mainstream media is in a losing game. I think they're in a zero uh, zero hour type of situation where the more they attack, the more the Wall Street Journal attacks someone like David Pakman or New York Times wrote about David Pakman, the more people know about David Pakman. So it's the, it's kind of like what happened with Bernie. Barbara where, Streisand effect. Where they yeah. tried to keep you know him off the TV, they tried to keep him out of debates, but the more you learn about Bernie, the more people uh, approved of what he was saying. So it's like the same thing with mainstream media, right? Um, the more they attack cannabis, for example, the more people are like, wait, what is the truth about cannabis? And then they go to the internet and they look it up and they're like, whoa, it cures cancer. Wait a minute, huh? You know. So I think the mainstream is in a kind of a, a cycle, an entropy, a cycle of entropy where uh, it, the more it talks about the truth, the more people turn away from it. You know. That's also, I mean, on a very psychological basis, negative, negative re like repetition and reinforcement is a huge thing. Uh, a, a, good, a good example that like people use is like. Instead of saying like, like the more you say Obama is not a Muslim, people still hear Obama and Muslim, right, yeah. and it still resonates in their brain. By saying like Obama is a Christian, you you are changing the messaging just by that word choice. And this is and it's that kind of stuff. So the more you say like David Pakman's bad, David Pakman's bad, people hear David Pakman. The more you say Donald Trump lied, Donald Trump lied, the more people still hear Donald Trump said. Right, or and Donald Trump at all. Right, or Donald yeah, Trump got at like all. Billions of dollars of free advertising just through all the controversy he created. Yeah, yeah. but neg like negative reinforcement is just as powerful as positive reinforcement. So just repeating a bad thing, repeating a lie or falsehood or a bad thing is still but I making it resonate the, in people's brains. With the, the, the polls have the mainstream media like 8% approval or 6% approval. I mean, at one point, does that go to zero? So yeah. in fact, people are starting to understand, well, every time this peep, this news outlet says, you know, some government official said this, people are like, wait a minute, is that the truth or is that a lie? And more and more now people are like, that's actually a lie. Anytime they see officials say, it's like, yeah, <laughs> that's obviously propaganda <laughs> and lie. Yeah. yeah, what if, like, what are you talking about? So, you know, and that comes from the, 
lying into Iraq, getting lied into Vietnam, getting lied into the Spanish-American War, getting lied into, you know, what, what war were we not lied into? Um, lied into the war people are starting to, uh, <laughs> yeah, People are starting to realize, oh, this is all a, a, a game to, 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 the, to them. Yeah. So we're wrapping up. So uh, Steve, you brought up a good point that I want to just address real quickly about, like, how the legacy broadcasting systems are influenced by the way they do advertisements. And, it, and they really are beholden to these advertisers because they, they don't want to expose them for doing something bad. Why does or, Northrop Grumman advertise on CNN? Am I buying a, a, a rocket or a jet soon? <laughs> like, no. Right, I mean, hello. right. So one of the things we're hoping to do with Bad Mirror TV is, in, in economics, there's externalities, positive and negative externalities. And through having people being able to vote on the ads that they see and potentially give uh, a, an advertiser more or less advertising based on the quality of the video as well as the quality of the company themselves, is going to make them feel their negative externality. So if you're oh, a company that you don't like, that's doing something bad, they're polluting, they're causing obesity, they're doing whatever, I can downvote their video because I don't, like, I don't want them to do well. That's awesome. And so I can the converse like of that, an Mobile absolutely. Video. And the converse <laughs> of that is awesome. you can upvote an advertisement from your local mom and pop, and you say, "I want you guys to get free advertising because you guys are so great." Which uh, goes into like Upworthy and what you were doing in Tom, and and hopefully maybe uh, come to our dance parties. We so we had one. Fun. We had one last question. Maybe we can um, grab it. I think we're got to go. Oh, yeah. Well. well uh, the fellow over here has been oh, had his hand up for a while. So if it, if, it, if it can be quick, then uh, uh, yes, no. Um, we did a lot of outreach on college campuses. Uh, Max Abramson, former state representative. Uh, we did a lot of outreach on college campuses for media to uh, liberty stuff. Um, do you think that college campuses, bullet boards, that type of thing, is a good place to go for independent media? Uh, more and more, yeah, for sure. I mean, certainly uh, YouTube. Videos, you know, I, I, I don't know. I think millennials. unless you're on Berkeley's campus, and you're gonna get punched in the face for saying something they don't like. <laughs> I mean, I think I think historically in the United States, anyway, like college campuses have kind of led the progressive movement uh, in a lot of way, in, like, in a lot of directions. Like what people say is like like dumb little college kids or whatever ends up kind of becoming the progressive more platform more. eventually. Eventually, uh, and I think I mean look at like in the '60s and stuff like. So I do think college, colleges are a good place to lead with that because you're developing early thinkers. And there are problems with the system, sure, but I think it's a good place to start. But more and every single minute, there are more just rich people at, in colleges oh, that, so that don't really have any <laughs> Oh, no, I have problems with <laughs> investment in people. I can go on that topic for a while. I know. <laughs> That's a different topic. Too. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you all for coming. Uh, put your hands together. <laughs> These guys. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Bad Mirror TV. Check it out. Yeah, check it out, especially in a month when we launch. <laughs>